Thank you for joining us today. We are Abundant Grace Church, and I am Bishop Ramon Di Maria, and I am the pastor. Our teaching today is titled, The Fruit of the Spirit. I will be starting off with the book of Galatians, chapter 5, and verse 22, which reads, firstly from the King James Version, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, and faith. The Good News Bible renders it, but the Spirit produces love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. My beloved, we are to bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Now, where it speaks of, but the fruit of the Spirit, that means that we are to yield ourselves to the Spirit of God. Through salvation through Jesus Christ, a change has taken place. Our heart has been changed, and our spirit has been changed. And it has been changed into the likeness of Christ. The only way we can be changed is by the Spirit of God. When the Spirit comes in to our lives through repentance and accepting Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord, we become a vessel for God to use. We no longer are a tree that bears fruit for the flesh or bears bad fruit. But we are a tree that is guided and led and taught and convicted by the Holy Spirit. And through this, we can only bear good fruit. So what type of fruit is being bared? First of all, love. And what is love? It is an intense desire to please God and to do good to all mankind. It is the very soul and spirit of all true Christianity. It is the fulfilling of the law and what gives energy to faith itself. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 6 says, For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, more uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. So no matter what, who you are or what you are, love is to be desired and shown through your walk with Jesus Christ. And it speaks of joy. And I know that there are many people that seem not to have joy in their life. But this joy that we're talking about is the exaltation that arises from a sense of God's mercy communicated to the soul in the pardoning of all the soul's inequities and the prospect of the eternal glory of which it has a foretaste in the forgiveness of our sins. Now, Romans chapter 5 and verse 2 says, By whom also we have access by faith into his grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Beloved, we have joy through salvation, knowing that we will one day be in heaven with our Savior and Lord. Another fruit is peace. This peace is the calm, quiet, and order which takes place in the soul that has been justified. See, instead of the doubts, fears, alarms, and dreadful things that we worry about, of course, in which every true penitent person 
or more or less feels, we have this peace, the peace of God that passes all understanding. See, a true penitent feels the peace of God, but an unpenitent person doesn't have peace. I know this for a fact from ministering to many people over the years. You see, peace is what we call the first sensible fruit of the pardoning of sin. And we can see this as I read Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, which says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And just knowing that we will spend eternity with Jesus Christ, with God, is enough to give us that, that peace, the peace that passes all understanding. So, so far, in dealing with the fruit of the Spirit, we have love, joy, and peace. So we're going to move right along to long-suffering, which is long-mindedness, which is being able to tolerate things, being able to put up with things. It is not being easily consumed by the things of the world or not hurrying through something, but enduring it. Like when we face adversities, we endure and we go through, knowing that it is only for a season. It's bearing up also through all types of troubles and difficulties of life without actually murmuring and complaining and submitting ourselves cheerfully to every dispensation of God's providence and therefore deriving benefit from every adverse occurrence that we face. Then we have gentleness, affability. We have to see that in this gentleness that we are not harsh in any way and that we easily consider sharing what we have as Christians, sharing our Christian excellence with others. I mean, a good education and polished manners help us when it is brought under the influence of the grace of God. And when it's and with our education and our knowing, I'm talking about biblical education and our experience through watching the mannerisms of other Christians. When we allow these things to influence us, these things will bring out the grace of God and have a great effect, not only on our lives, but on the lives of others. And of course, my beloved, how we treat others. And dealing with another fruit, goodness, this is a perpetual desire and sincere study, not only to abstain from every appearance of evil, but to do good to others, to do good to the bodies and souls of, of men, to the utmost of our ability, to help them, to feed them, to clothe them, to, to feed them spiritually, to feed them physically. But all this must spring from a good heart, a heart that has been purified by the Spirit of God. And then the, the tree, which is us being made good, good fruit will proceed from us. We will bear good fruit, the goodness of God through Christ Jesus our Lord. Another fruit we have is faith. Here it is used for fidelity. Punctuality in performing promises. Carefulness in preserving what is committed to our trust. In restoring it and its proper owner. 
we're storing it to the one function. In transacting the business confined to us without betraying the secret of a friend or disappointing the confidence of our employer. Faith to believe that we're going to get paid. Faith to believe that we will receive an honest day's wage for an honest day's work. Faith to believe that where we are is where God wants us to be. Faith to believe that when we do what we're called to do, that God will reward us for our labor, which means that he will touch the hearts of our employer to give back to us or to see the good points that we have and to promote us within the ranks of our employment. So as we see, the, the love and the joy and the peace and the long-suffering and the gentleness and the goodness and the faith of our walk with God is very important both to us and God, for it is the fruit of the Spirit who lives in every true born-again believer. We're going to move to Galatians chapter 5 and verse 23, which reads from the King James Version, firstly, meekness temperance against such is no law. Now the good news Bible renders it. Humility and self-control. There is no law against such as these. So, as we see, Paul has added a couple more. And they are meekness and temperance. Now, meekness is mild, indulgence toward the weak and erring, patience, suffering of injuries, feeling a spirit of revenge, an even balance of all tempers and passions. Matter of fact, what it sums up to be is the entire opposite to anger. When we deal with temperance, that is, continence, self-governing of yourself, or moderation, principally with regard to sensual or animal appetites, which is moderation in eating, drinking, sleeping, etc. Do everything in order and at a specific time period. Do it right. Don't overindulge. Don't overdrink. And don't be lazy and slothful. Don't sleep so many hours a day. Remember that we have a job to do for God. And don't eat thinking you won't have enough to eat later on. So you eat it all now. Or don't continue to just drink, drink, drink. And drink it now because... Later on, you might be thirsty, but drink it in moderation. And Paul also says that in verse 23, against such there is no law. See, my beloved, those whose lives are adorned by these virtues that were mentioned cannot be condemned by any law. For the whole purpose and design of of the moral law of God is fulfilled in those who have the Spirit of God, producing in their hearts lives, the fruits that were mentioned. And they're all good because it's the fruit of the Spirit. In our last message, I talked about the desires of the flesh. Now you can see that the, desire, the desires of the flesh are the direct opposite of the fruit of the Spirit. So therefore, my beloved, it is the job of every true born-again believer to manifest the fruit 
of the Spirit. Now, as we go to Galatians chapter 5 and verse 24, we read in the King James Version, And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Now the Good News Bible renders it, And those who belong to Christ Jesus have put to death the human nature with all its passions and desires. So the Good News Bible brings it out. Uh, and in a different life. Now, in the uh, basic English Bible, it says, and those who are Christ have put to death on the cross the flesh with its passions and evil desires. So we know that, Paul said, well, we are crucified with Christ. Well, Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. And Paul being a a Christian is the same as we are today. So we might say that every Christian is crucified with Christ, but yet, nevertheless, we live. And it's not just us that live. It is Christ that lives us. So put to death, we have been crucified to evil desires of the flesh, the sinful desires of the flesh. So let's move right along, and we're dealing with, and they that are Christ, they have crucified the flesh. So, in dealing with this, let me say that all genuine, all true Christians, I'm not talking about people that go to church, I'm talking about those that have repented and accepted Christ as their Savior and Lord. These have crucified the flesh. And so far removed from obeying its dictates and acting under its influence. So they have crucified, every born-again believer, true born-again believer has crucified their sinful appetites. They have nailed them to the cross of Jesus Christ, where they have died with him. Now, in Romans chapter... 6 and verse 6, Paul wrote, Their old man is crucified with him, or words, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So, our old man is dead, the flesh and its affections and lust. It is crucified with Christ at Calvary. This body of sin has died. So therefore, knowing that it is dead, it can't do it. It is lifeless in our bodies. It can't control us. So anytime a voice that from Satan to sin, you just tell him that you are dead to sin because you have died your flesh. It's crucified at the cross. So, and here we see that God has fully designed us to walk and believe in Christ and the deliverance of Christ at Calvary. See, we have outward affections, of course, and these affections could cause us to sin, but we put them down, these these adverse passions and lust, and even disorderly wishes that we may have and desires. And we do this because we love God, we love Christ. So we feel compelled to, to love and be pure and clean and not desire anything that is against God, which means to live a life of self-denial to the sinful things of the flesh. This is what we call the true Christian character. Moving right along to verse 25, it reads firstly from the King James Version, if we live in the spirit, 
let us also walk in the Spirit. Now the Good News Bible renders it, the Spirit has given us life. He must also control our lives. And in the uh, basic Bible in the English language, it says, if we are living by the Spirit, by the Spirit let us be guided. So my beloved, what are we talking about? If we are true Christians, only true Christians can live in the Spirit and by the Spirit. So if we profess to believe in Christianity and that the Spirit of God lives in us, we ought to walk in the Spirit and bear fruit in the Spirit. Therefore, we are to show this in our lives and in our conversation. We are to show the world, this lost and dying world, those that live in darkness, that the Spirit of God truly dwells within us. Beloved, there is a way that seems right to a man. The end is death. See, we who are Christians profess to be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. By his influence and agency, we live a spiritual life because by the Spirit. In doing this, we profess that we are not under the dominion of the flesh, nor are controlled by its appetites and desires. If this is true, then let us all, as true Christians, as professors of Jesus Christ, as our Savior and Lord, act in a manner that dictates so. Let us yield ourselves to the Spirit's influences and show the world that we are controlled by the Holy Spirit. Let us walk after the Spirit of God. Beloved, in walking after the flesh, we cannot in any way show that we are the sons of God. That just doesn't happen. We are to walk in holiness. We have not allow ourselves to fall under the condemnation of the, the things of this world. We are not to allow ourselves to be ruled by the things of the flesh. Romans chapter 8 verse 5 says, For they that are after the flesh do things of the flesh. But they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. Let's continue walk after the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5 and 16 says, This I say then, walk after, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Let us, how could I say, demonstrate the things of the flesh. But let us demonstrate the things of the Holy Spirit. Let's move right along to Galatians chapter 5 and verse 26, which reads, Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. The Good News Bible says, we must not be proud or irritate one another or be jealous of one another. The Bible in basic English says, let us not be full of self-glory, making one another angry, having envy for one another. 
Beloved, be desirous of vainglory. Let us not boast in our attainments, lifting up ourselves to be superior to others, or seeking honor from those things which do not possess more good, in birth, riches, eloquence, or whatever. Don't think that you are so super spiritual. That is just the beginning of a great fall. Don't tell somebody that while you're more holier or more spiritual than them. But show kindness and love and help those that are weak in the flesh. Don't tell somebody that you've been a Christian longer than them. Therefore, you're more holier than them. You're closer to God. It doesn't work that way. Or because you have riches or possessions that you should hold dominance or prominence in the church. Don't seek vainglory. Don't seek pride. Be humble. Be merciful. Be loving to your fellow brothers and sisters. And even those that are without, that are on the outside of Christianity, those that are lost, don't walk around like you're better than them because remember where you came from. You were one of them. You were lost at one time. But Christ had mercy on your soul. And he could have mercy on their soul at any time. He wants that none should perish, but all should come to eternal life. Remember that. You weren't born saved. And you never know what God will do in the lives of those that you put down or pretend to be better than. Be humble. Walk in humility. It speaks of provoking one another. Which don't endeavor to set yourself beyond in any way. See, he who professes to seek the honor that comes from God should not be desirous of vainglory. He who desires to keep the unity of the spirit in a bond of peace should not provoke someone. He who knows that he never deserved any gift or blessing from God should not envy another whose blessings they received from God. Beloved, remember that you don't want to provoke people, showing that you are any better than they are. If Christians in general would be content with the honor that comes from God, if they would take heed to give no provocations to their fellow Christians, if they would cease from envying those on whom either God or man bestows honors or advantages, we would soon have a happier and more perfect environment in the Christian church than we have at this present time. Christianity, my beloved, requires us to esteem each other better than ourselves and in honor prefer one another. Beloved, he who lays this to heart, or even thinks he is indispensably necessary to his salvation, will have a rude awakening one day. God doesn't need any of us. God uses us. But he doesn't need any of us to promote his son, Jesus Christ. Remember that evil tempters are the bane of religion and totally contrary to Christianity. Beloved, those that 
try to esteem themselves up higher than what they are, are not bearing fruit or planting seeds for the kingdom of God, but are doing so for the flesh. Don't allow yourself to be caught in this. Let us do things that will unify the body of Christ, that will edify the body of Christ. Don't allow temptation to enter into your walk with God. Remember that God has a plan and a purpose for you. And that purpose is going to be achieved. Allow God to use you for his praise and glory. Don't follow the wrong voice. There are two voices out there in the world. The voice of light and the voice of darkness. Beloved, let me read a couple of scriptures to you in closing from the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 6, verse 6 says, Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all things. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Verse 8, For he that soweth to his flesh, of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit, shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in season we shall reap if we faint not. And a very important verse here. Galatians chapter 6, verse 10. And as we have therefore opportunity, let us all do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. And with that, I'm going to close. Check your motives. Seek God. Ask him to show you your shortcomings and what you need to do for him. Thank you for being with me today. I want to leave you with this closing thought. But in the form of a question, are you bearing fruit for the kingdom of God? Or you might say, I go to church, I give in the offerings. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about bearing fruit for the kingdom of God because the Holy Spirit of God lives within you. That's bearing fruit for the kingdom of God. Let me say this, that if you have never accepted Christ as your Savior and Lord, then the Holy Spirit does not dwell in you. And not that God won't use you. He will. He used Pharaoh. God used Pharaoh to to show that God was all-powerful and almighty. So he will use anyone that he desires. But working for God does not get you to heaven. It's only a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. If you have never committed your life to Jesus Christ, I want to pray with you today to lead you into the of God. If you'd like to receive Christ as you, please pray this prayer with me and mean it from your heart. Father God, in Jesus' name, I heard the teaching message today, the fruit of the Spirit. And I have not been bearing fruit because I don't have the Holy Spirit living within me. Because I have never repented and asked Jesus Christ to be my Savior and Lord. But today, I want to change that. I'm sorry for my sins. I repent of my sins. I want to accept Jesus Christ 
your Son as my Savior and Lord. I ask you to forgive me of my sins and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He came to the earth. He was crucified, died, was buried, and rose again from the dead on the third day and ascended into heaven where he is now, sitting at the right hand of God the Father. I believe this in my heart and I confess it with my mouth and believe through this I have received eternal life and I thank you for forgiving me my sins and for washing me and cleansing me in the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Beloved, if you said that, let me be the first to you in the kingdom, but you must have meant it from your heart and confess it with your mouth. What I want you to do now is go to a Bible preaching teaching church, speak to the pastor, tell him what happened, ask him to anoint you with him, to pray with you, to pray for you, and ask him to give you a Bible if you don't have any. Ask him to lead you and guide you and to mentor you. And ask him to baptize you in water by full immersion in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then what I want you to do is, please contact me and tell me that you received Christ Lord. At grace at att.net. That's abundant.grace at att.net. And just earmark it, Pastor. I'm the only one that reads the email. And tell me what happened. What else I want you to do is, Grow and believe that all things are possible through Jesus Christ. And beloved, you can also contact us through our website at www.abundantgracechurch.net or through our other website at www.abundantgraceofmidlothian.com. That's Melothian is spelled M-I-D-L-O-T-H-I-A-N. Or just put Abundant Grace Church. It'll come up on Google. Put my name. It'll come up. We have videos on YouTube, Ustream, Spreaker. We have them on all these media outlets. But please, let me hear from you. God bless you. We are Abundant Grace Church. Our teaching has been the fruit of the Spirit from Galatians chapter 5 starting with verse 22. My beloved, remember that God has a plan and a purpose for you. God bless you, my beloved, and go with God.